So in the early 1900s in the Bitterroot Valley, there was a mysterious killer. And this mysterious killer caused a disease called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, or the black measles. And at the time, it was not known what was causing this disease, but there was a high fatality rate. So the state of Montana asked the Public Health Service to come out and help investigate what was causing this disease. Now, originally it thought that maybe this disease was caused by drinking the snow melt because almost all the cases of disease happened early on in the spring. But when the investigators started looking at the patients, they noticed that there were tick bites on these patients. And they thought perhaps that this disease was tick transmitted, which was a novel concept at the time. But when they looked at the tick, they found a bacteria. And this bacteria has been named Rickettsia rickettsia after the discoverer, Dr. Ricketts. And they found that that tick was capable of transmitting that bacteria to people, and that's what caused Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Now, over the years through research at Rocky Mountain Labs, as well as other institutes, been able to develop therapeutics for the treatment, particularly antibiotics. And now, although we still have the bacteria and the tick that transmit Rocky Mountain spotted fever, the fatality rate is greatly reduced because we can treat it with antibiotics. Now, a lot of the original research done at Rocky Mountain Labs, the first work done on rickettsia, some of it was done in an old abandoned schoolhouse. And this schoolhouse was called, um, or at least referred to in one of the newspapers, as the house of crawling death, because all of the ticks that were being studied at it. Now, the lab has grown quite a bit since then. It is now a state-of-the-art, world-renowned research facility but we still do a lot of uncommon disease research. Um, and I'm sure if you can look on the screen, you'll see some of these diseases that you'll recognize because some of these diseases can go from being uncommon to becoming common. And the one I'm going to focus on today mostly is Zika virus. And firstly, because that's one of the viruses that my lab studies, but it's also a really good example on how a virus can go from obscurity to basically being a household name. So Zika virus was originally discovered in the Zika forest of Uganda, hence the name Zika, um, back in 1947. And it was found to infect both monkeys and humans. But it wasn't considered to be a virus of any major concern because Zika virus really induced a very mild disease. Most people were asymptomatic, so they had no symptoms when they were infected. And about a third of the people developed a minor rash, a slight fever, and, event, and sometimes conjunctivitis. But those symptoms disappeared in about seven days. So it wasn't an important or considered to be an important virus to study. It was also found in um, Pakistan, Malaysia, and Indonesia in the late 70s. And then the first real outbreak of Zika virus didn't occur until 2007 in Yap, Micronesia. And it still wasn't considered a major disease because, again, it didn't cause really any severe disease in humans. And it wasn't until an outbreak in 2013 in French Polynesia where it became um, thought that maybe Zika could be inducing something else. So in 2013, there was a spike in a disease called Guillain-Barre syndrome in French Polynesia. And this syndrome is a temporary paralysis. And sometimes it can be fatal. And so it's a disease that's fairly often reported and it's a very rare disease, but in French Polynesia in 2013, there was a spike in these um, Guillain-Barre sy uh, syndrome cases at the same time that there was a Zika outbreak. And then following that, in 2015, there was also a spike in Guillain-Barre, but there was another disease that also popped up, and this disease is microcephaly. So microcephaly is a rare disease that is, when a baby is born, the head is an abnormal size, so it's a smaller head, and that's due to the fact that the brain doesn't develop correctly. So there is also an outbreak of Zika virus in Brazil at this time. And it was thought that perhaps Zika virus is causing this microcephaly. Now, we know that correlation does not equal causation. So it was investigated to see what this, if there was a link with Zika virus. And it was shown that the women who had had these babies with microcephaly had been infected with Zika virus, and Zika virus was found in autopsy tissues from the brains from some of these microcephaly children. So it was a pretty good indication that Zika virus 
was causing this in microcephaly. And then um, through use of animal models, we were able to demonstrate that indeed infection with Zika virus in, this, in animal models could result in infection of the fetus and in damage to the brain. So it was pretty good evidence that Zika virus is causing this disease, although we still don't know the exact mechanism by um, exactly what's happening or how the virus gets into the fetus in the first place. Um, so that's a good example of how a virus can go from being fairly obscure to being a world-renowned virus. So how do these viruses emerge? Um, one of the things that can happen is a change in the virus itself. And so, and this has been observed in Zika virus, there's a couple of changes, a couple of mutations in the viral genome, and that's thought to potentially be the reason, or one of the reasons, why, why this virus is now able to cause microcephaly. And we do have evidence throughout history of viruses evolving and causing disease in humans. And one of the prime examples of that, of course, is HIV. HIV originally was a virus that was found in non-human primates, primarily chimps. And over years of interactions between humans and chimps, the virus slowly evolved to be able to infect humans. And then, of course, we now have HIV infection and the epidemic of AIDS. Another way that viruses or bacteria can go to an, and cause an epidemic or cause an outbreak is when it's exposed to a new population of people. So endemic viruses or bacteria, people build up immunity, and therefore it's harder to transmit and cause an outbreak or an epidemic. However, if a virus gets into a new population, you have a wide open opportunity for that virus to cause disease. And in the case of Zika virus, when it infected people in Brazil, they had never been ex previously exposed to Zika virus, and the virus could have widespread, or widespread infection of a large number of people. So how do viruses and bacteria get into a new population of people? One example is human movement. So humans can move to the site of where the pathogen is. And this was shown, of course, with Rocky Mountain spotted fever. The tick that carries rickettsia had always been in the valley, but it wasn't until the settlers came into the valley that you actually got the disease. So the humans moved to where the pathogen was. But we also have where the pathogen's able to move. And this primarily occurs when the pathogen is carried by what's termed a vector. So a vector is a carrier of a virus or a bacteria or a parasite. And it generally includes things like mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas. And so when they move, they can infect a new group of people by the, the, the viruses or bacteria that they carry. Now, why do they move? Why do they, are they able to get to new places? One of the factors can be environmental change. We know that with climate change, we have increasing temperatures, and that has increased the range of the ability of some mosquitoes on the area where they can um, thrive. And one prime example of this is Aedes aegypti mosquito. So Aedes aegypti is a mosquito that can carry Zika virus, dengue virus, and chikungunya virus. And the, this mosquito's range is increasing with climate change and with an increase in temperatures. And because of this, we're starting to see infections of these viruses in places that we have not seen before. Another way that you can get the movement of vectors or the pathogens themselves is due to globalization. We have fast transportation around the world. And if you'd like to travel, it's great. You can actually fly to another country or another continent in a day. The thing of it is, is that if you're carrying a virus or an infection, you can carry that virus or bacteria with you and then transmit it to an entirely new population of people. It's what we see with the flu season every year. Um, it's also true that with the vectors, so any mosquito or tick that can potentially go along for the ride when we're transporting goods and materials across, it can take that tick or mosquito along with it. If it comes into an area where it's able to reproduce and it has the right environmental conditions, you can get a new mosquito strain in a new location and that mosquito will then have the viruses that it carries along with it. So those are ways by which we can get an outbreak. Is there anything we can do to prevent this? So one of the important things, of course, is research. 
And research is really important for the identification of the pathogen, such as a case with Rocky Mountain spotted fever needed to know that it was caused by a bacteria in order to know to use antibiotics to treat it. We also need correct diagnosis. If we have correct diagnostic tools, we can determine who's infected, who's not infected, and be able to treat the infected people. We also need the development of therapeutics and vaccines, and it's one of the reasons we need to work on some of these uncommon diseases is because unlike what you see in the movies where it takes a day or a week to develop a vaccine, it takes many, many years to get a vaccine developed. And so we have to be able to be prepared for the next outbreak. You have to have work done on uncommon diseases so that we can develop the vaccines that we need to treat. Another thing that we need to do, and just as important as the research, is communication and education of the general public. And the public plays an important role in preventing outbreaks and treating outbreaks. Um, and prevention, of course, certain things, simply washing your hands during flu season is an important way to prevent the spread of disease. Um, also true for norovirus. It's also true for, it, for a mosquito-borne virus. If you, there's a mosquito in the area or a specific disease in the area, um, not having stagnant pools of water in your backyard is an important aspect. And that was brought up with Zika virus as far as one way to prevent Zika virus. Early detection is also important. And early detection is, can be upset by public perception. So we know in the past through with the Ebola outbreak, as well as with HIV infection, that there were negative public perception and misinformation that caused people to not report the fact or not get checked on whether or not they actually had that disease. And so public perception is critical. And part of the problem is that we have miscommunication or misinformation. You can go to the World Wide Web and find just about anything that you want to find. However, some of that information is wrong. So it's important that you're able to determine where to get the correct information. And there's two really good websites, the World Health Organization website, as well as the Center for Disease Control, that provides nice information on information on different pathogens, how to prevent them, what the symptoms are, what they cause, and how they should be treated. And then finally, and what I really want to focus on is vaccination and the importance of vaccination. We've been able to take diseases that have become common, such as smallpox, measles, and polio, and take those from the common status to the uncommon status simply, well, not simply by, but because of vaccination. So smallpox is a worldwide problem, and there was protests and anti-vaccine movement against smallpox vaccine when it first came out. But because of the smallpox vaccine, we've been basically able to eradicate smallpox from the world. Polio virus, it was the swimming pool disease. And back in the 40s, people were afraid to send their kids to the swimming pool because they'd go to the community swimming pool, come back seven days later, and they'd have paralysis. And so with the advent of the polio vaccine, we've been able to substantially reduce the number of cases of polio worldwide. So it's important to develop the vaccines for treatment, but it's absolutely essential for public communication to provide the information on why it's important to be vaccinated and to have people get their vaccine. Thank you all for listening. Thank you.